And uh, pure in life is free. the podcast, but I have uh, officially uh, made my decision and I will be attending Harvard University, hopefully in the fall. Um, they haven't released exactly what's going to be happening with everything going on in the world, but um, I think I'm going to start either way. So very excited. Wonderful. And do you know what you want to make sure? Um, yeah. So the great thing um, about a liberal arts school is you kind of have some time to figure out, you know, where you want to go and, and what you want to major in. I'm really interested in neuroscience and biology. I've always kind of uh, thought the pre-med track, but I also love writing. And so English is something that I'm also considering. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. Oh, wonderful. I know you were with it a couple days when we recorded the podcast yes. um, a couple um, weeks ago and, and, and uh, trying to figure out uh, kind of what, what we were doing. We're doing. So um, I, um, in leading up to it, we're going to talk a lot about uh, indigenous women, women, the play that you've written, and, and the work, the work that, that you're doing. Story. And I think we're in, in, we're in a time yeah. where having difficult conversations is so important. And the work, the work that you're doing is you sharing the story of the women who are murdered or who are missing. So first, I want you to so tell me a little bit, bit about, about the story of the project that you're doing, doing. and then uh, about, about the play. The and, uh, and, and then from, from there, there talk about, um, some, some of the stories, stories that, that we wanted to highlight. Yeah, so... Um, the Native Storytelling Project, um, which which started about a year ago now, was kind of born out of the lack of Native representation in the arts. Um, something that I noticed kind of in, in what I was doing was the fact that there are not really a lot of roles for Natives that don't fall into this very specific stereotype that can often kind of be um, a negative, perpetrate a negative and perpetrate that invisibility or that idea that Native people are, are something of the past that they belong in a museum and, and that's you know I think invisibility is what we call a kind of a, some a modern form of discrimination and so for me the native storytelling project started as kind of a way to authentically share a story and also to kind of go back to what that worldview was and so um something that I kind of started the journey went with was uh finding traditional stories, you know, these creation stories, these ancient stories that um, I grew up learning. And it was kind of really great for me to go back to the beginning and to be able to gather them and listen to community. And, um, and then from there, I was really inspired to kind of write this contemporary piece that kind of places these uh, traditional stories, interweaves them alongside a contemporary narrative. And it all kind of ended up being a theater for social justice effort. Um, it ended up dealing with this uh, with this issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls um, and, and everything that that means. And it also ended up being a community endeavor. So what was really amazing about it was that it was a kind of a cast of 20 people who ended up putting on the play um, and it ended up being a 90 minute thing, which was surprising to me. But um, yeah, so it ended up uh, being all community based and that was the beauty of it, right? And, and that was super amazing. Um, we had, you know, a huge diversity of generations of, of different people from different backgrounds to play these roles. Um, I got to play in it as well. Um, my sister joined me in this endeavor and we received funding and a grant um, from the Dragon Kim Foundation after that. Um, after that first initial performance. And that was amazing because my sister was able to join me on that. She's uh, two years younger than me. Um, she's also an actress and uh, she uh, plays my sister in the play as well, which was a little bit, which was uh, nice. And um, so we were able to kind of build this and grow it. And, and we're still thinking about how we do that now. We were supposed to do more performances. We've done it about eight times now. Um, all different venues um, about to about, I think it's a little over a thousand people that we've reached directly with the play, which is, is super amazing. Um, but we're thinking about how we bring it to an online in this COVID-19 when live theater cannot happen. Um, so we're thinking about ways to transition into that, but it's been an, an incredible journey and I think it's a super important one too. So, okay. 
don't think a lot of people are not familiar with really what is the basis um, of, of your play, which is these large numbers of indigenous women are, are missing. And, and you know, one of the things that, that I think we hear about when someone goes missing is the more they keep their story out there, right, the, greater the greater the chance that they will be found. Um, and so, when I you and I talked about this, uh, before we did this, what, what are some of the stories of women, of women their, their names, where they're from, um, where they're from that we can help just, share um, and just um, put light on their lives and, and you know, hopefully continue that. to help with that work? Yeah, I think that is, is definitely something that's really important. And, um, you know, just to kind of frame it, um, Indigenous women they and Native women, and, and that's non-binary and, and trans as well, they go missing and they're murdered at rates that are 10 times higher than the national average. And so, um, you know, there's so many stories and 95% and of these cases, they aren't documented and they aren't reported by national news media. And so, you know, we're just in the beginning stage stages of understanding the magnitude of this issue because these statistics aren't included in the annual report to Congress. And so it really is a kind of a group that has been purposefully, I think, ignored. And, and that's part of the erasure of Native peoples that has, has always been um, you know, something that that we face. And one thing that we have in the play is kind of a scene where the names of some of these women are listed. It's the very beginning of the play. We say their names um, kind of in a protest and, and in a chant. And so, you know, there's so many. And, and what's what we like to do is we have a talk back after every performance and uh, people from the audience can share stories of women that they have known who, who have gone missing, who have been murdered. and it, they, if they want to, to include their names in that, because it really is for them, you know, above everything else. Um, and there is some action being taken. Um, you know, the, the Savannah Act, um, which was uh, kind of more recent, um, was named after uh, a woman, a young woman who who was murdered and, and who was pregnant at the time. And you just hear these terrible stories. And, and more recently, Selena, not afraid. Um, she was just a 16 year old girl. Who, uh, who was, her body was found and um, she was, she died, she was in, from Montana, so she died of hypothermia. But the problem, and the problem with that case and the problem with so many other cases is that they fall through the cracks. There's a lack of jurisdiction regarding whose job it is to, to find these women. And so the families feel often that is there. They're the only ones who can take initiative, who take initiative to find the, these um, women who do go missing. And and so it is, um, you know, a, a, a lot about kind of sharing their stories um, because it is a lot of the times the families that are leading the efforts and they don't have the resources. And, you know, does it fall into the jurisdiction of the sheriff or the police or the federal law enforcement? And it, it gets, it's very muddled. And so there really needs to be clear, distinct steps that, that need to be outlined. Um, and, and more and I don't think people, taken. and I don't yes, think people realize how many layers, layers there are um, within, within Naval community, community, within um, Native, Native communities, tribal communities, that there, you know, it isn't just, I call the county sheriff and my, you know, my sister doesn't come home one night, that there are all those different jurisdictions. And I think they realize that they think that, well, that's just what you do, you call a number, number and that's where someone that goes to get together. Right, and I think that, yeah, that's definitely an issue on reservation. Um, that's just whose job is it, and uh, that's a big issue. And then, um, uh, kind of a recent, uh, kind of the first data analysis comprehensively that was done by a Native woman um, through the uh, in Seattle, uh, kind of found that they're disappearing. Native women are disappearing at similarly high rates in urban areas, which is something that was previously unknown. And so. You know that raises a whole nother a set of questions and uh, another set of actions that need to be taken for sure. So let's let's kind of go to the 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 micro level. Let's start with you and then help um, help educate myself and, and other folks that are listening. Um, you know that the 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 experience of being a native woman is not um, you know it's not unilateral. It's very different. So tell me about your heritage. Um, you know, I live in a place where there are several um, reservations and knowing that, you know, each tribe is very unique in, in its identity and its background. So um, 
tell me your personal heritage story, um, and um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, yeah. So um, for sure, there are so so many different tribes, and I think a lot of the mistakes that a lot of people make is kind of grouping them into to one um, to one group. But the fact is that there's so many different nations and we all look very different and uh, there's different stories and there's, uh, you know, different traditions and um, ways of living and beliefs. And so for me, um, I'm enrolled in the Kauia Band of Indians uh, through my father's side, um, which is uh, pretty close to where I live. Um, the reservation is located um, and um, so because that we live in South Southern California, that's the tribe that I was enrolled in. But my mother's also a uh, Turtle Mountain Chippewa um, from up north, and so kind of have both. But um, uh, for me, you know, I kind of grew up urban, very urban. I go to school in Orange County. I think, you know, at the school that I went to, there's like one other Native American. And so it is a very unique, um, I think this urban Indian experience is something that is very unique and, and not talked about a lot um, because it is kind of these two very different worlds. Um, but for me, you know, I was always kind of really raised in these stories and, and in this idea of oral tradition. And I think that's why um, I'm so interested in storytelling. My father, um, he was, uh, there were three young men that were kind of trying to save these traditional Kauia bird songs, which were gonna kind of be erased and, and die out with the last three elders who still remember them. And so he kind of went with uh, with his brother and and a friend and they asked, um, you know, these elders to teach them. And they were like, no, we will not teach you. Um, but they kept going back and then eventually they did uh, they did learn them and, and kind of brought them back. And now you can search up on YouTube and there they are. And so that was really inspiring to me. Um, and I think something that really made me want to, um, you know, bring back the story. So, so that's kind of where I'm, yeah, where, where I come from. I think about too, some of the questions and, and again, going back to, this is a time that we really want to bring awareness and we want to have those difficult conversations and ask those questions. Um, and I think, you know, I've had people say, well, do I, what does it mean to be enrolled in a tribe when you mentioned, you know, that you were enrolled, what does that mean? And then, you know, how do, what is the language to be used? You know, are, you know, do you consider yourself indigenous, uh, native? It, those are kinds of things I think people are like, well, I don't want to ask something the wrong way or be wrong. And so we're going to, we're going to go ahead and go into that, that area and just, um, you know, help us, um, to understand, you know, what language should we use? How can we, how can we share that experience? What does it mean to be enrolled? Yeah, so I think, you know, Native Indigenous, um, very, very similar to me. Um, I think something that's interesting about the word Indigenous, though, is that um, it's really a globally applicable. And, and so I think there's a lot of shared similarities in a lot of indigenous groups. And we all kind of have indigenous roots if you go back far enough, you know, no matter uh, your background. But in terms of, you know, what I always think is the most respectful or the best thing to do is always to ask someone what tribe they're enrolled in, because I think that that at least shows you have a consciousness that there are like Native Americans aren't coming from the same backgrounds in the same uh, traditions and same ways of life. And so I would say, you know, definitely go by the tribe. And then um, being enrolled uh, is kind of a definitely a federal thing. Um, sometimes it has to do with blood quantum. Sometimes it has to do with ancestry. But either way, you have to prove it, which is something that is very unique to Natives, having to prove your background and your identity. Um, and, you know, this idea of blood quantum, um, is something I think that for me, what I've noticed is being indigenous and native, you know, there's a, there's, I mean, just right now there's things going through where they're trying to, um, unrecognize certain tribes. And, um, that's something that's, you know, very harmful because then you're erasing people. And that's happened to so many native peoples who, who are unfederally recognized, but they still have that native identity. And so it really, to me, comes down more to a worldview kind of. And I think there is kind of a shared interconnected, uh, worldview that a lot of native tribes share, um, across the board. And, uh, and I think that's something that I've always found to be super unifying, even though the tribes are so different and, and there's different languages and they're entirely different, like because you speak one, you can't speak another. And so that's what I would say to that. 
right, well, we're going to take questions. So if anyone has questions across um, any of the platforms, I know we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, maybe Twitter, I think, <laughs> also. Um, now feel free to shoot those over to us, ask a question, um, and, you know, help us continue this conversation here for a, for a little bit longer. Um, Isabel, I, what was it like or to be, um, you know, in high school and you're, um, you know, you're one of two um, Native women? Yes. Did, you know, what is that experience like? You know, I think we think of high school as, uh, you know, it's either you're in this, this kind of clique or that clique, but what does that mean for your identity? And, and that experience for you, what was that like? Yeah, um, so I think like what I was talking about kind of urban Indian and, and being, you know, one of very few natives at the school, um, especially in Orange County, there's there's not a lot. Um, it's a very different thing. And um, I think this last year I was really able to kind of come into that identity more because it was something that I, I I, you know, it's like who you are and, and but you kind of feel like separate when you're around different people and you don't have that group. But um, kind of this past year doing the play and kind of bringing some of that to my school and trying to, we had our first ever Indigenous Peoples Day on campus uh, last last year now. Um, and that was really neat to me because even though, you know, there wasn't a lot of natives, it's still great to kind of push that narrative and get that education out there. Um, but being able to kind of write the play and and it being acted by so many natives and native youth too which is so so neat um that was really a really neat experience for me and i think it really grounded me um and it's something that i'm probably just gonna have to, when i go to you know the next the next step in life you know it's gonna maybe be a similar situation and um it's just kind of making sure that you still make that space and um I think being visible and, and uh, sharing the story is the most important thing for sure. All right, so we had a question from um, Twitter. How do you how do you cultivate community? Um, yeah, so that was a really, really important thing for this project because it was supposed to be for community by community. Um, and it was also kind of taking these ancient stories and putting them with something new. And that's always, you have to be very delicate and careful when you do something like that because you don't want to compromise integrity of, of the past, but you also are kind of trying to contemporary, make it more contemporary for your um, new audience. And so, um, that was something that I, I really struggled with, but I think because it all came from community, um, that kind of really helped it. And, um, you know, I had people come and, and kind of make sure that, you know, in the beginning stages when I was writing the script in the first place, um, bringing in people from community, making it really intergenerational. We had like a five-year-old and like a 90-year-old um, in some performances. And so that's something that was really unique. Um, but I, I did really... Think that it was important and and when people kind of learned about the issue or they already knew about the issue um it kind of built that community in itself because it's it's for a larger thing and i think that's something that art can really be used for and that can make art something that's really really powerful to kind of bring people together humanize all of us um and and kind of fill that empathy gap that um sometimes you know is hard so i think community is huge and I see Carolyn had a question. So what were some of the challenges, I'm reading Carolyn's question, uh, what were some of the challenges you had to overcome uh, with telling the indigenous stories through the earth? Yes, um, so kind of along the same lines, um, putting the, the theater piece out there and that was in a contemporary fashion, um, you know, and we also kind of in, integrated some other things, like we had the bird songs were part of it, and we had some flute music and um, different songs. And uh, they're kind of what we what we say is that the the play in and of itself is kind of a ceremony almost. Um, and that was, I think, framing it in that way kind of changed it because it wasn't very. It's not traditional theater in that um, it was kind of more than entertainment. Um, and in the fact that it was by community members and, and then it had this message for um, the, the woman. Um, so I think when we framed it more as that, um, as a healing kind of ceremony, 
um, that kind of changed it a little bit, but I think that it, it kind of aligned more closely with what we were trying to do in the beginning. What, what for you is the, the weight of responsibility? Um, the, I guess, you know, how did you feel knowing that you were, you had this, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say burden, and that's not responsibility to bring forward the story of um, these women, but then also um, to share their stories and their lives, but then also to you know, keep that in the context of respecting heritage and history and tradition. Um, did it feel like a burden? Did it feel like a challenge? How do you just, how would you describe that? It was a, it was a challenge, definitely. Um, but I think that it, it also brought a lot of meaning and purpose to me. Um, and it was, it was a really incredible experience and kind of thinking back to it, I don't know how we did it because it was like we had two weekends of rehearsals and then we just did the play. And uh, to me, that seemed impossible in the beginning. Um, and, you know, when we had our first performance, I remember like one of the actors had his lines written on his hand and it was like, it was, uh, it was like, you know, a very beginning baby step, but it was so important that we did that and we put it out because I thought it was going to be kind of a one-time thing and then it would, it was kind of going to be over. But, you know, there was kind of a call in the community for more uh, and that, and then we got asked to bring it to all these other different places. And hopefully, you know, after COVID-19, after quarantine um, ends, we can, you know, start thinking about how to bring it back. Um, what's really exciting is I think I'm going to write Manuel in a Heart into a screenplay. Um, we've gotten some representation to that. So that's totally changing it as well, you know. So it really, it's a, kind of a, a huge journey, much bigger than I ever thought it was going to be. But I think it's something that's going to kind of continue um, on as I go on, you know, whether that be through the screenplay or um, just kind of this larger issue isn't something that's going away, you know. And so it is a huge responsibility. And but I also think, you know, activism brings purpose and that's really great. And I've noticed in the cast, we have two young girls um, and I think it's really something that they really, really connected with and, and enjoyed because, uh, you know, they're part of sharing this story and it's for them, right? And so that was super empowering for me too. What resources would you provide people or suggest places that they go and look if they want to learn more um, about about the play, but then also um, the the stories that you've been sharing, and just to be better educated to understand the context. And you know, I think it's been called an epidemic, and it's absolutely right that it is an epidemic of um, missing and murdered Indigenous women across this country. So when people hear this, if they've never heard it before, what are some good resources, places to go that you can suggest for? Yeah, so one of the things that we uh, started with the play was we made these kind of buttons um, that we kind of pass out um, and it goes along with them is this kind of info infographic that was made by Abigail Echohawk and her team. And she was kind of the woman who spearheaded um, the initiative uh, kind of at the forefront to create this data analysis of these missing women to kind of first she had to prove it was a problem and so she was kind of reclaiming that data um, and she did that through the urban indian health institute um, and she created this great comprehensive guide that kind of brings statistics um, and also her findings and her work and so i always direct people to that it's super easy to find it's one of the first things that pops up when you just go to google um, but it's very comprehensive and the fact that it is all it is led by her a native woman woman is very important too because uh, she kind of frames it in that perspective and it also kind of calls out the things that need to change if we're going to see real and meaningful you know change in this area um, so I would always encourage that um, and it, you know that information is out there but you have to dig because it, nobody's going to tell you about it right um, it's it's an issue that's very underrepresented um, because you know we're just uh, kind of that visibility again, going back to that. Um, another thing is for me kind of art is super important. I think seeking out those indigenous artists is really, really great because there's some great work being made right now. Um, 
that um, is so, so empowering that really is about kind of reclaiming that narrative. Um, and, you know, whether that be in literature, one of my favorite books uh, by Leslie Marmon Silco, um, Ceremony, um, that was written a while ago, but that's, that's great. And she kind of does the same kind of storytelling, um, kind of traditional and contemporary, but there's great um, artists out there um, that are making music right now. And a lot of it has to do with these issues. Um, but I think once you start really delving into them and understanding the facts and then understanding, you know, what's being done, you'll kind of see that there's a connection between all of this, right? The taking of women is part of a larger taking of land and culture and language and identity. And, and they're all so interconnected that you can't really understand one without understanding the other. And, and I think that's what a lot of people find when they start to kind of dig deeper. Give us one, as we're wrapping up here, one action item, one step in in a sentence um, of something we can do to to even make a difference, right? Move that needle even the slightest bit um, that when we, we click off of everything, what is the, the one simple, and I hate to say simple because it isn't, but the one thing you'd say, this is what I need you to do to help continue making change. Yeah, so to go along uh, those lines, one of the things that we point out in, in the kind of that infographic, which does have kind of a list of, of some things you can do, and one of them is really simple, just call your representative. And it's, you know, I think that's a, an action that a lot of people are taking right now. Um, with everything going on in the world, there's a lot more of trying to hold your representative accountable and understanding what and, and going out to vote and, and things like that. And, um, you know, obviously, that's a very complicated uh, a thing, but um, I think calling or writing an email to your representative, there is actually, you know, I was back in DC um, as as part of a kind of a through the Center for Native American Youth at the time that some of these acts were running through Congress that deal with missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and um, so I was kind of able to to give that out. And I think that you know the more people who bring up this issue. Um, it's it's so important. So whether that be on a state level or a local level, um, you know, supporting that way. Another thing that's really important right now is kind of the COVID-19 epidemic on a lot of the reservations. Uh, the Navajo Nation has been hit really, really hard. Um, so I would say right now something that's really dire is kind of seeing going onto their platforms, those grassroots organizations, and seeing what you can do to help because they have donations and you can make masks and things like that. Um, and they have, you know, specifically for indigenous women and they have different groups like that. So doing your research like that is a great first step um, because right now there is a lot going on in, in a lot of the, uh, the tribal nations. Well, it has been an absolute joy um, to, to speak with you. And of course, I got to, to talk twice because we recorded the podcast and we get to do this. Um, and we will get to meet each other in person. Um, normally, our of course, class of 2020 would have been in person in April. But um, I know you all got to meet by Zoom at least once. Yes. Um, and working on the Leadership Development Institute, the LDI. I know mm -hmm. I've got a meeting for that uh, later tonight about that program mm -hmm. continuing that. But the class of 2020 is absolutely amazing. I've been able to, to speak and meet um, a handful. And let me tell you, if you have any doubt about the world going in the right direction, you just meet the class of 2020. And you know that it's um, for a rough year that I think most people have had, you all have been um, your class and um, your generation have been absolutely inspiring. And you specifically, Isabella, with the work that you're doing um, and the voice that you're giving. I think that's what's really powerful about what you're doing is you're not, um, you're not only giving a voice to one, you're giving a voice to generations. And I think that's absolutely incredible. So thank you for joining us. Oh, I see another one of your class of 2020 classmates mm. is saying, yay, hello, Lucas. Um, and I'm so glad again you got to join me. If you've caught this and you don't know what the Koch Scholars Program is, um, it is an absolutely incredible way to, of course, help with scholarship for college, but more so to create community. And we say we're a family, and that is exactly what we are um, and how we connect and we share stories. And we, you know, our goal is to change the world. Um, and so if you want to learn more, you can follow us uh, on our platform, search for Coca-Cola Scholars or Coca-Cola Scholars Foundation, and you can learn more there about 
the incredible scholars that have come through the years. And of course, if you are going to be a high school senior, you can learn there about when the application opens up in August and the process that you go through for all of that. Um, and if you want to see more of our conversation, it is on episode four of the SIP, um, Scholars Ignite podcast. And you can see that wherever you download, listen, uh, whatever platform you use to listen to any of that. And I have to agree, let's see, I'm looking here, Chicken Wings, yes, Isabella, <laughs> Woman of the Year. That is that is an apt uh, comment and note to, to end this all on. So thanks to everyone that, that joined us. Isabella, best of luck as you, you. Um, get ready for college. And thank you again for the work you're doing and your, your amazing voice and art and change that you're bringing. Um, somehow I feel like you, you do you pack 28 hours into 24 and I don't know how you do it, <laughs> but it is, it is inspiring. So, and thank you everybody for joining us. And for, if you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube, we're so glad that you could be with us. Um, and here in a couple of weeks, I know we've got another podcast coming up. Uh, with the incredible and amazing Coach DKR, Coach Darren Roberts, will be doing uh, the next two SIP podcasts. So thank you again. And if you have any more questions for Isabella, you can be sure and follow her on social media. I know she's on Instagram or send us a message at Coach Scholars. And thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.